Well, you can tell vacation season's still here. <laughs> we hope that everybody's gone is having a good time. Hate for them to be going to spend all that money and not have a good time. <clears throat> Lord, it's getting all the expensive time vacations now. This morning we're going to look into the matter on the subject of eternal life. And uh, uh, it's a very wonderful subject. And if you can catch the, uh, and I think you can, you catch them, what I'm trying to say, but it's a subject that's a little difficult to put into words. And uh, I'm going to read a scripture that I think most of you know, John 3, 16. <laughs> Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> Glory. Now, I right away, the thing that I have been pointing out as we talked about this, and this, of course, lays down the principle of the fiend, so many people read this and have everlasting life. They thought, well, Lord, now that I'm saved, I'm going to live forever. And they don't stop to think that they were going to live forever whether they got saved or not. The sinner's going to live forever. And uh, just like you are. And so when we think about that, when it talks about the Bible, talks about eternal life or everlasting life. It's not talking about longevity of life. It's something else altogether. The sinner and the Christian are both going to live forever. But one is going to live in what the Bible calls the second death, and the other will live in what the Bible calls everlasting life. <coughs> Amen. But it has nothing to do with <coughs> mere existence. It has to do with the type of existence that you're going to live. And so... The everlasting or the eternal life that we get has to do with the type of existence that we're going to live rather than the fact that we will be living forever. Now, in the New Testament, in the Greek, we have three words that are translated life. And we want to look at those words just a minute. And uh, the first of these is suke. I'll write these down for those who like to put them down for their own notes. Suke, that word is used. Now, of course, that's a very familiar word. In the, um, we bring it over into the English. Just like that. You change that U to a Y, and you've got the English word, the psych. And that's the word where we get such words as psychology and psychiatry and so forth. Psychology and psychiatry, psychosomatic. <laughs> All those words come from the word psych. And this simply means your physical life. The physical life. And uh, it indicates the, the and what we would call, in, in long words, the animal sentient principle only, which means that you breathe and air going in and out your nostrils, you're alive. In other words, a dog and a cat and a lion can have that same kind of life, just like a human. It's, it's the animation of life that you live and breathe. It's, it's strictly the physical life, and it comes from the Greek word to breathe. That's where the word comes from. To breathe. And it's all it means, the sentient animal physical properties of life. Now there's a second word, zoe. Zoe. Now this signifies vitality, the, uh, the vim, the pep, the get up and go, <laughs> the, the vitality of that life. That's what that indicates. And uh, it's from the verb to live. It's, it comes from the Greek verb to live. 
Now this is the word, and I'm going to put this back out this direction. This is the word that's also a trump. Well, no, we'll leave that for just a little while. We'll leave that just a little while. Then we have a third word that's translated life, bios. And this means the manner of existence. What kind of a life you're living? I don't know what word that's for. <laughs> I didn't even go that far with it. But that means the manner. Now, all three of those words are in the Greek, translated life. Now, here's a very interesting thing. I don't know that it will mean anything to you, but I'm going to point it out to you to show you. In the English language, this was the, this was the most the more noble word, bios, and this was a lesser word. So when you're talking about uh, animals, we use this word and call it zoology. And when we were talking about people, we use this word and call it biography. So you see, this was what we would call the more noble word, the way we have it in English. That word would refer to animal life, where this one would refer to human life. However, in the Bible, it's just switched. And this has become the more noble word in the Bible, zoe. And this is a lesser word. This is the word that the Bible uses where Paul said, you know, my manner of life from my youth up is the word he lived. But this word has become the noble word. The, and so consequently, in our Bible, this word is also the one that's translated quickened. Or quick. The quick and the dead. And this word has become associated with the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Vitality. Now you can understand why it would. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us spiritual vitality and spiritual life. And let's put right in here. Two together. So, in the Bible, where it speaks of eternal life or everlasting life, it uses this word right here. Zoe, zoapeo, zoapeo, which is quickened, which has to do, and the, the, uh, the indication is this, that this eternal life which we receive is a special a life without that vitality is spoken of as death, even though you may be alive and breathing. Take this away, take the quickening away, and the Bible calls it death. You remember that's what it was doing in 1 John. Even though you're still breathing just as much as this one, you're still just as much alive physically as this one. You see what I mean? But one life has the indwelling vitality of the spirit. The other life, now I'm not saying necessarily the infilling of the spirit, speaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost now, I'm speaking of the vitality given to us by the spirit of the Lord. Amen, you know, if the, it's the vitality of the spirit makes this life, and the lack of that vitality makes this dead. Now you see in the book of 1 John that we've just been studying, you remember he called the apostasia death. 
even though they were alive and like you are in the church, sitting on the same pew, participating in the services. But without this flow of the Spirit, their life is spoken of as death. Now, all the world of second death is, is this is this lack of the spirit vitality carried into eternity becomes the second death. Well, in Genesis, when told us to die, about That's the right. You got it right. That's exactly right. Physical death. But the devil tried to make them think that he meant physical death because uh, she did eat it and she didn't drop dead. <laughs> And there was a real interesting puzzle there, too. How did the devil get over to the idea of physical death when they'd never seen anything die? <laughs> but he got it over to him, so. But all right. Now, you begin to see, I think you already begin to see a, a vision of what it means, the eternal life and the life without the vitality, which is eternal death. The only difference is not in existence, the difference is in the spiritual vitality involved. So we can race these two. Now we won't be in common, we won't be using these two at all. We're just simply to be using this one. Because the Bible only uses this one. These other two, suke and the bills, are only used in relationship to human life. This is the one that's used in relationship to spiritual life. And that's the one you'll be involved with when you study what the Bible says about eternal life. Now, and uh, as this, this one fellow in his word study made this statement, and I'm going to uh, put it down here, that this word zoe is the way he expressed it, and I think this makes a good expresses the sum or the total of mortal and eternal blessedness. Now there is just about as good, and he felt like to give it its meaning, that was about the best way. It expresses the sum of mortal and eternal blessedness. So this eternal life that the Bible speaks about. In other words, you're speaking of the sum total of the blessing of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Take that away. It's death, even though you may still be in the church. And that's what he has expressed. Now, we can see. Now, thinking of it from this standpoint, let's read some scriptures which bring out and it shows you now you can read some of the most old familiar scriptures in the Bible and you can see how it brings that out. Matthew 25 and 46. Matthew 25 and 46. And, and you'll see how it brings out the difference. He's talking about those who gave food to the hungry and gave drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, visited the sick and those in prison, and ministered, and, in the, and some who didn't. And those who didn't, in verse 46, he said, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So you see, he, draw, he, he makes a picture very clearly here. Eternal death is eternal punishment. Life, the blessing of God. See, he makes a contrast there. And then we can go to Luke 18 and 30, where you have another contrast made. Luke 18 and 30. And uh, this leads into one of the most beautiful things that 18 and 30 said. And it's talking about, uh, then let's go back to verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the age to come, that's in the new earth, life everlasting. So you see, he has life everlasting here equated with 
material blessing. Amen. So, so eternal life. Uh, let's put some of these things down. What he said here. Eternal life means number one, free from punishment. Because he said he put it in conjunction with eternal punishment. And material blessing, being of course in the new earth, I, I don't like to expect to use that word material. I don't have a better word I can use because he said you receive. And then uh, in uh, Acts 2.28, Acts 2.28, he makes a lovely statement here. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So eternal life consists of full understanding and joy. Full revelation of God. And then we go to Romans 5 and 17. It said, for if by one man's offense, that was Adam, death reigned by one, much more they who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And so it's, abund it's unlimited grace. Now, there are things that he contrasts. So you see, uh, using the, the term eternal life, he's expressing what? The sum of mortal and eternal blessedness, you see. He said eternal life is free, freedom from punishment. Eternal death is eternal punishment. Eternal life is material blessing in the, in the new earth, in the new age. Eternal death is a loss of material blessing. Eternal life is a full revelation of God and joy of the Lord. Eternal death will be the absence of these things. Eternal life is unlimited grace. <laughs> Eternal death is the absence of unlimited grace. But you're both still breathing physically as far as uh, suke, you're alive. But one embodies all of this, the sum of mortal and eternal blessedness, whereas the other is the total lack of it. Now. You talk about, let's, let's make a contrast right here like he intended during the Bible. Suppose you had to spend eternity with punishment, constantly being punished, which is what the lake of fire will be. All right? You would spend eternity never again receiving one blessing of any kind in, in the material sense. You spend eternity cut off from God altogether with no joy whatsoever. You spend an eternal, an eternity completely isolated from the grace of God. No wonder it's called death. It's the second death. But that, those things, <laughs> so, you know, it'd be interesting now to take some of these things where they draw the contrast and read them into John 3.16. Just try that and see what you, the picture you shall not perish, but have eternal freedom from punishment. And he that, uh, go back to John 3, 16, where it says we have eternal life. Just substitute some of these other things in this place and see how it brings that thought out, the contrast that the Bible makes. And uh, I'll just read the last part, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal material blessing. And he that believeth in him should not perish, but have an everlasting revelation of God and joy of the Lord. And he that believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting, unlimited grace of God. You see, you, re you read those things into, other than the word life, then you get the meaning. Now, it was especially John in his books, and we've just been studying First John, but if you go now with me to the Gospel of John, it was he who especially used this John in his Gospels and in his epistles, 1 John especially, and in the book of Revelation, said more about life 
than any other biblical writer. He said far more about it than Paul did, even though Paul wrote more. So John is the, he expresses the gospel of life. Now let's go to John 4 and 14. And I'm only reading just a smattering of these. I could uh, read um, many, many more. And uh, John 4, 14 said, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So everlasting life then is an unfailing source of what Jesus calls the well of water. Amen. Now we're going to get to that a little later. But uh, this divine life, expressing the sum of mortal and eternal blessedness, it's like in the physical, a good drink of cold water out of an artesian well. <laughs> it's this continuing thing. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, John in chapter 6 brings, he continues with his analogy. In chapter 6, first of all, verse 27, labor not for the food, it says meat, it means food, which perisheth, but for that food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. This eternal life is an eternal feast, as in the physical meal after meal with an ever failing. You've just got to, the right kind of food you love and enjoy. Glory to God. This kind of helps you to uh, get a picture of what eternal life is. <laughs> yes, the very blessed word. That word labor not for the meat to the that means just don't give your life only to material things. You know, it doesn't mean not to get out and work and not to get out and play because the Bible in another place says be diligent in business. But it means that you're, you're giving your whole time to have enough to eat and clothe and you don't give enough time to your spiritual welfare, which is going to be an eternal thing. That's what he's doing is making a contrast there. And uh, in other words, uh, let your principal labor be for that food which endureth and everlasting life. The food of life, glory to God. And uh, the, what they say then, and the, let me see, in these same one, over in verse 30, or down in verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Did you ever stop and think about what that expression meant? Bread of life? He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He's talking about everlasting life. He's talking about eternal life. Glory to God. And let's go on down here. I won't leave this here, so I'll put the number five below it here. Five. It's, a, it's an eternal spring of water. Understanding, of course, what I mean by that. It's eternal bread. And by the way, I can go on later in the book of Revelation. I won't have time today. But to show you that when he talks about the waters of life and the bread of life, he's speaking of the fact, and it's in the set letters to the seven churches of Asia, that in this eternal life, God will constantly be responsible for our maintenance. <laughs> Amen. That we'll have an un that our thirst will be eternally quenched and our hunger will be eternally taken to. Amen. That's and that's you know what that word is let me just give you we did this one Tuesday morning, but of course for the war some of you wasn't hearing them. In one of the letters to the churches of Revelation, he said to him that overcomes will I give the white stone, you remember? And you know what he's signifying? <coughs> In the old Roman Empire, which was in effect when John wrote that, they had the Olympic Games. That's where they started. Well, it started in Greece, but carried over to Rome. And they had these big stadiums, these big amphitheaters, big Colosseum in Rome. And you know, and when they had the 
they had games that they called the Olympics, just like we do now. They called them that. It's from the, the name is from Mount Olympiad in Greece, and where they said the gods resided on top of Mount Olympiad. And they had the Olympic Games there in the Colosseum in Rome, and the Caesar always attended. You see, Caesar is not a name, it's a position, like you say the king, the Caesar. He was Caesar Augustus, like you say King Augustus. And the Caesar would always attend these games. And they had a special box where the Caesar sat. And when they would have, and the decathlon that they call it now in the Olympics, that's their 10, the deck is 10. The decathlon is, and then they have the pentathlon, which is five, it's serious. And when a person, an athlete, would win these games, win a game like they do in the Olympics, Immediately after he won, he, he was the winner. He was the victor of the Olympics in his particular theme. He was taken right there before the emperor, right there in the emperor's box where all the thousands of people could see it. And he, he went up there and he knelt before the Caesar. And the Caesar put one of these laurel wreaths on his head, like you see in your history books. Mr. Reed, what he said, don't he see it? And then he would give him a white stone. And his name was engraved in that stone. It would be engraved in that stone. He gave him a white stone, and his name was in it. That's exactly what it says in Revelation. A new stone with your name in it. And that athlete kept that stone. And from then on till the day he died, the Roman government was responsible for his upkeep. No matter where he went anywhere in the Roman Empire. When it got mealtime, he walked into an inn, and he presented the stone, and he got a free meal. He, when it got night, he walked into an inn, presented a stone, and he was put up for lodging for the night. Walked into a store, he needed a new toga suit, <laughs> presented a stone, the clothes were free. I mean, he carried that white stone the rest of his life, and everything he wanted, When, it, when it, if, a, if the stagecoach came along, they did have coaches in those days, and he wanted to go to the next town, he just presented the stone and rode free. In other words, after he won, he was the overcomer, he won. He had the white stone with his name in it, and he got everything, he was taken care of totally the rest of his life. And you know, it said in the book of Revelation, to him that overcomes, I'll give you a white stone with your name written in it. Glory to God, and that's the eternal spring of water, that's the eternal bread, that means God is unlimited grace, that eternal life means that once you gain it, glory to God, God gives you the white stone, you are going to be taken care of the rest of your life. Now, that means your eternal life so from here on out, glory to God. You will never again be allowed to go hungry or to be allowed to be thirst. Uh, never again, it said, God will wipe the tears from their eyes. It's eternal maintenance. That's what I've said. Eternal life means eternal maintenance. It doesn't mean you're going to live forever. It means you're going to have eternal maintenance from God's hand. And the person who goes to the lake of fire, they're just as much alive as you are, but they don't have that eternal maintenance under the law. <laughs> For the grace of God. Now that's the yes, ma'am. Well, you know, that you were telling about mm -hmm. uh, the, the man that uh, you say the white stone. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of that scripture where it says, uh, He that overcometh will inherit all things. Inherit all things, yes, ma'am. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's one of the promises. He will inherit. You see those seven letters to the churches, every one of them says to him that overcometh will I. So if we put them all together, you've got the total promise to the overcomer. <laughs> <laughs> There's seven of them. Oh, glory to God. Now let's go to John 8 and 12. John 8 and 12. Hallelujah. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's eternal light. Glory to God. And that can be used in, in several applications. Those who do not have this eternal life are in eternal darkness. It Hell is, or rather the lake of fire is spoken of as utter darkness. That means there won't be a molecule of light in hell. Or I should say in the lake of fire. There won't be a molecule of light in the lake of fire. And, uh, but we have eternal life. And that light 
is a light of life. Now, uh, you know, no plant, no life can exist without light, physically, on this earth. You can't grow plants without sunlight. You couldn't live without sunlight. Let them lock you in a dungeon <coughs> cave where you're never in the sunlight, and uh, you will exist, but life and vitality will be sapped out of your physical strength. And it takes light to live. I mean, that light is the light of life. That eternal light. And so you see, those who miss this will languish forever in eternal utter darkness. Well, that'd be enough to make me want to miss it. <laughs> Amen. All right, and let's continue. Now, in a few of the 17 and 3, 17 and 3. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That is saying that eternal life means eternal understanding. Glory to God. An eternal understanding and revelation of God. I've already got that written down on number three there. A full understanding and revelation of God. That's what's involved in eternal life. Now let's go to 1 John 5 and 20. We've just been in 1 John. And by the way, if you think I'm giving you a bunch of these, I'm just giving you a smattering. <laughs> I'm just giving you enough to bring out a point. I'm, I'm skipping most of them, but these are enough to go by. 1 John 5 and 20 said, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding, glory, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. What is eternal life? Having an understanding, a full understanding, glory to God. Hallelujah. A full understanding of what God is. Now I'm going to read just one more here. Revelation 21 and 6. See, John also wrote Revelation. And like it, you remember what I said a while ago, John is the one in the Bible who, who puts forth what eternal life we live. John is the great teacher of eternal life. He said in Revelation 21 and 6, And he said unto me, that is Jesus said to John, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And so that's eternal spring of water, eternal fountain of water. Glory to God. And you know what I just now noticed? <coughs> that we run into the number seven again. And I hadn't even noticed that right now. Number seven means completeness in the word of God. And I just, just right now, I didn't notice that, that the Bible gives the seven blessings that make up eternal life. You see, he said, Zoe expresses the sum, the total, of mortal and eternal blessedness. And the Bible has it in seven categories, which means completeness. Glory to God. I, I ran on something right here in front of you folks. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, all right. Now... That is what eternal life is all about, right there. Take it away and you've got eternal death. But it has nothing to do with you being alive, you see. All right, now I want to go into something else here. Well, better not. I think I'll wait till next week. You won't day. be here next week. Oh, that's right. Well, we get here next <laughs> Next week we're going to be out of town. Mm. And there are several things that the Bible, and I'd like to go into these. The Bible lists five essences of this eternal life, and we've looked into several of them this morning, but I want to really uh, go into each one and explain to it, and then I want to talk about the tree of life, which the Bible speaks of that was in the Garden of Eden, and now it's in heaven. But we better stop this morning on this and take that up when we're back again. Uh, we will be out of town next week, but then the week after next, I'll be here, and we'll continue this uh, eternal life. We're going to have a potluck luncheon the next Tuesday. Uh -huh. I don't <laughs> but we haven't realized the fullness of it. 
one of these days, you're just getting a little taste of it right now, but one of these days, when we enter into the fullness of this system, it is going to be something the human mind can't conceive. You can't conceive what an actual, the actual receiver of this is going to be. Oh, glory to God. Amen. People don't realize either one. What, what means not to be saved and what means to be lost. That's right. Because it's a bid to be more people saved. That's right. That's true. Now, you turn it around in your Bible, and where it talks about the second death, add the lack of these things, and see where it leaves you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to borrow some money for you. Glory, how much you want to borrow? Five huh? dollars. Mm -hmm. Lucifer rose up in sin, and Paul said, okay, how do we know that in the future, when God sets up the new earth, that some cherubim or angel will rise up and sin again and start this thing all over? But God has a written guarantee in the Bible. If you have a written guarantee, it's never going to happen again. And that has to do with the study of the tree of life. I'm sure it won't take a little more time than it does. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have heard of study that during a thousand years, and then they might take a look at it. Yeah, they won't, yeah, no, yeah, they'll sin. But they can't sin open sin. They can't sin that would cause problems. They can rebel against God. In the book of Zechariah, it says that the nation can rebel against God and he'll bring plagues on them during the millennial reign. But now when you get over into the new earth, which is beyond the millennial reign, that can't happen anymore. <laughs> yeah, but during the millennial reign, there will be sinners. Well, the reason why I couldn't understand that is the ones that come back from heaven are supposed to be saved because they don't have any sin. Well, they're ruling, though. They're ruling over the people on earth, too. Oh, yeah. And the people on earth who escaped the tribulation and got through it, you know. Not everybody's going to be killed during the tribulation, and we're going to have a... An earth full of humans during the millennial reign, and they'll be sinning a lot of them. They'll be rebelling against God. Will we?